Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Matthew chapter 12, verses 38. Matthew chapter 12, verses 38. Certain scribes and Pharisees answered saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee, or we desire a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and an adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the well's belly, so shall the Son of God be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh, the Bible says, shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. Because they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. The queen of the south shall rise up in judgment with this generation, the Bible says, and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Somebody shout, Hallelujah. Say, praise God. Now, Pharisees and scribes come to Jesus and they call him master. I still have my reservations whether they really meant master in the sense that they were really ready to learn from the Christ or that that was a title that was conferred on him to put him in trouble explaining himself harder things. But true to form what we know, it's in the nature of the Jew to seek for a sign and the Greek to seek after what? Wisdom. It's principle, standard. So they come to Jesus and they say, Master, show us a sign. We want a sign. And then Jesus tells them, an adulterous and evil generation that seeks after a sign. What makes them adulterous? What makes them evil? What have they done wrong by asking for a sign? And Jesus gives them two signs. He said one of the signs shall be given the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he says for as Jonas was three days and three nights in the world's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. You know, as one of the signs is that I'm going to be dead and I'm going to be risen from the dead. That's one of the signs. Say amen. And he says, and because of that, he says, the men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment in this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas, the prophet, and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. And then he said also, for another sign, he says that the queen of the south shall rise up in judgment of this generation, and she shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth, he says, to hear the wisdom of Solomon. But he says, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Let's explain that. Let's explore that for a moment. Now, for all of you, you know, that God raised the man after his own heart, which was David. David makes a solemn oath to Bathsheba, that after my death, your son, the seed of mine that shall come from your womb, he shall become king. But Sheba means daughter of oath. And so indeed as true to the word of God was, an oath was sent to her that she shall carry the future king. Praise God. And so he was born by Bathsheba. Solomon was raised in the kingdom. And the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 4 verses 3, Many of you know, he says, when I, Solomon, was a son with my father, David, give me the amplified of that, tender and the only son in the sight of my mother, Bathsheba, 
Verse 4 says, He taught me and said to me, Let your heart hold fast my words, keep my commandments and live, get skillful and godly wisdom, get understanding. They told him, get understanding. He says, do not forget and do not turn back from the words of my mouth. So David tells his son that when you're seeking, seek godly wisdom. When you get to a point of asking, seek godly wisdom. Because David, by the eye of the Spirit, knew that one day the king that should come after him will be given a divine opportunity to place a demand for the continuation of the kingdom of Israel. And he tells him, at the time when that comes, ask for wisdom. The man after God's own heart could only extend the kingdom of Israel by a seed after him. And when he identifies this particular seed, it's interesting to note that he imposes on it and tells it that there you get into the place of God asking what you need. Remember to ask for wisdom. Remember the Bible doesn't just say he's a man after God's own heart, but the literal translation is the man with the heart of God. The man with the heart of God begets a man that places a demand on the wisdom of God. Because only the man with the heart of God knows the price of the wisdom of God. Somebody shout hallelujah. Only a man with the heart of God knows the price of the wisdom of God. And the wisdom of God can only connect to a man that has the heart of God. The heart of God begets the wisdom of God. You understand what I'm saying? And so you all know the story. A time comes and he has an encounter with God through the form when he's king. And when God appears to him, Solomon makes a prayer in First Kings chapter 3 from verses 9. He says, give your servant an understanding mind, again with the amplified version, and a hearing heart to judge your people that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge and rule these great people? The Bible says, it pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. And God said to him, because you have asked this and have not asked for long life, I want you to underline, because you have asked for this wisdom and have not asked for long life, underline long life, and riches, underline riches, know the lives of your enemies, but have asked yourself understanding to recognize what is just and what is right. The Bible says, behold, I have done as you have asked and I have given you a wise discerning mind so that no one before you was your equal nor shall any arise after you equal to you and so solomon has this thing that sits on him when it comes to solomon and i want you to understand it solomon's wisdom was a continuation of the instruction god gave through his servant David to the soul of this young man and at the point of experience in a dream what the father instructed to the soul when the son was awake is what the son could ask for when he was asleep you understand and then Solomon asks for wisdom the same thing his father had instructed him to ask for and the scriptures tell us God grants him wisdom now Second Kings again, chapter 4, verses 29, continues to tell us the wisdom that was given and functioned on Solomon. He says, and God gave Solomon exceptionally much wisdom and understanding and breadth of mind like the sand on the seashore. I want you to think about it. God gave Solomon exceptionally much wisdom and understanding and breadth of mind like the sand on the seashore. But if you wanted to calculate the wisdom of Solomon, you needed to count every grain of sand on the seashore to know how wise that man was. And to think for a moment that all of that wisdom was dwelling in a man who pumps blood with white blood cells, red blood cells, one heart, two ears, two eyes and a nose. Just to think that all of that was in a man that was born by men is amazing alone. But it happened. Somebody shout amen. And the Bible says, for Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the people of the East 
and all the wisdom of Egypt. In other words, one man had wisdom that excelled the wisdom of a nation. You find one fellow and the wisdom on him is bigger than all the wisdom a nation has built. Somebody said hallelujah. That's just how much was on one man. And the Bible says, for he was wiser than all other men, than Ethan, the Ezraite, and Haman, Calco, Darda, the sons of Maho. His fame was in all nations round about. And the Bible says, he also originated 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. He spoke of trees from the cedar that is in Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of the wall. He spoke also of beasts, of birds, of creeping things, and of fish. Men came from all peoples, that is all tribes and cultures and ethnicities and groups. Men came from all peoples to hear the wisdom of Solomon and from all the kings of the earth who heard of his wisdom. Everybody who had the wisdom on that man stood up to come and just hear what is on this man. Everybody came just to hear what is on this man. Somebody shout amen. And now, we now enter Solomonic wisdom. We enter now the mind and the soul of Solomon to see what God had placed on him. A vision comes and one time he wants to define the wisdom that God gave him. The wisdom that he understands according to his revelation of wisdom. He says in Proverbs chapter 3 verses 13, he says, Happy is the man that findeth wisdom. This is wisdom according to Solomon. The wisest man that has ever lived. The man wiser than the men of the east. The man wiser than kings and of whom kings came to. This is Solomon speaking. The Bible says, Happy is the man that findeth wisdom and the man that getteth understanding. He says, for the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver, and they gain their robes and find gold. He says, she is more precious than rubies, and all the things that thou can desire are not to be compared unto her. In other words, if you enter the heart of desire and say desire, you will desire even the highest desire in the world you'll ever have. And he says, when you get your highest desire, the highest desire ever possible in a human heart, and compare it to wisdom, Wisdom is still far greater than any man's desire. Are you hearing me? Now, he says, length of days is in her right hand. Remember, Solomon did not ask for long life. He asked for wisdom. You understand what I'm saying? That's why God says, because you have not asked for this, I have given you wisdom. But you see, when he gave him wisdom, he says, length of days, is in her right hand and in her left hand are riches and honor and the bible says her ways are ways of pleasantness and all her parts are peace verses 18 says she is a tree of life she is a tree of life he says to them that lay hold upon her and happy is everyone that retaineth her he says the lord by wisdom has founded the earth and by understanding he has a the heaven. This is the thing that he used when he was creating us. It's big. This is to Solomon. This is to Solomon. He was just the kind of man who, even in his freest state, when his heart yields, he starts to ponder the deepest things that any human being can speak. And so his name went abroad. Nations came to listen to him. Kings, you know, took all kinds of things to him, and they came to him. And then on one instance, a queen of Sheba hears this guy. She hears about him. And the Bible says she comes in First Kings chapter 10. Let's read from verse 1. He says, and when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, the Bible says she came to prove him with hard questions. And the next verse says, and she came to Jerusalem, the Bible says, with a very great train, with camels that bear spices, much gold, precious stones. When she was come to Solomon, she communed with him all that was in her heart. And the Bible says, and Solomon told her all her questions, and there was not anything hid from the king which he had not told her. You know, there is nothing she asked that Solomon didn't have an answer for. Are you following me? And the Bible says, and when the queen of Sheba had seen all Solomon's wisdom. Now, I want you to note, the Bible says, when the queen of Sheba heard 
of Solomon's wisdom. The Bible says when the queen of Sheba had seen all Solomon's wisdom, all Solomon's wisdom, that means everything he spoke cast a vision. Everything Solomon spoke cast a vision. Somebody shout amen. Everything Solomon spoke was vision. And because of the wisdom on his life, everything around him was emulating, was manifesting manifesting the wisdom of God in his life. The Bible says she saw Solomon's wisdom and the house, the Bible says that he had built the meat of his table had wisdom, the sitting of his servants had wisdom, the attendance of his ministers had wisdom, their apparel had wisdom, his cupbearers had wisdom, his ascent by which he went up into the house of the Lord, the way he went up. She's not talking about the temperament by which he enters the house of God. No. She saw the mode of worship. She saw the pattern by which this man entered the presence of God. And she knew that there's a wisdom of God upon his life. And the Bible says, and there was no spirit in her. You know, she fainted. She was smitten by this fellow. And the Bible says, and she said to the king, it was a true report that I had in my own land by thy acts and of thy wisdom. How be it, I believed not the words until I came, and mine eyes have seen it. And behold, the half was not told me. In other words, when I asked these questions and saw all of this stuff, why did the queen say half was not told me? It is because in some of the questions asked and the answers given by wisdom, there are things that hit her spirit by vision that no man could have articulated in explaining the wisdom that was functioning on Solomon. Whatever she saw in the kingdom of Solomon was a lesson. It wasn't grand and beauty. There was a lesson to it. She learned too much that day just by sitting under a man whom God had given great wisdom. And the Bible says, And behold, the half was not told me, and thy wisdom and prosperity exceeded the fame which I heard. He says, Happy are thy men, happy are these thy servants which stand continually before thee that hear thy wisdom. Blessed be the Lord thy God which delighteth in thee to set thee on the throne of Israel because the Lord loved Israel forever. Therefore made thee king to do judgment and justice. When she had the wisdom coming out of Solomon, she knew God loved Israel. She knew God loved Israel. And Israel was loved in the expression of the spirit of wisdom that sat on Solomon. Somebody shout amen. Shout amen. And so that's why people mention the statement, Solomonic wisdom. Solomonic wisdom. Oh, I need Solomonic wisdom in this. Oh, I think I need Solomonic wisdom in that. I think I need Solomonic wisdom in this because of what we see on Solomon. And then God says, With all you have had, with everything you have had on one man, God says that the queen of the south will judge this generation and she will condemn it. Why? Because she paid a price to come from wherever she came from to come and listen to the wisdom of Solomon. And he says, and behold. Now, watch. He did not say, hear or listen. He says, behold. This is something you have to see. He says, behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Which is Jesus. If Solomon had greater wisdom than Egypt, How many of you understand the meaning of Egypt? If Solomon had greater wisdom than the wisdom of Egypt and all the wisdom of the East, one man like this, and they tell you that if you were to calculate his wisdom, even the sun on the seashore, if each grain was an idea, if each grain was an idea, You'd need to count every sand on the seashore to understand how much exceptionally endowed that man was. And then he says, uh -uh. But one with greater wisdom is calm. 
one with greater wisdom is come. In other words, the Queen of the South will say, how can you fail? How can you be poor? How can you die early? How can things go out of line for you? How can you go back to Egypt again? Why would you rely on Egypt to feed you? Let me tell you just how much Solomon saw. When a man says that she is a tree of life, this is Solomon speaking. He says, she is a tree of life. And we go back into Genesis and find two trees. One tree was of the knowledge of good and evil. And the other tree was a tree of life. And God refuses man to eat of the tree of life. Listen, God refuses man to eat of the tree of life. Because man was so corrupted. And he knew that if a man eats of the tree of life in his corrupt nature, he will not die, he will not fail, nothing will, nothing. Are you hearing me? And then Jesus starts to show you that the vision that Solomon has and says wisdom is a tree of life to those that lay uh, hold of her. He was seeing a typification of a sort of a figure that later in the New Testament becomes a vine. And he says, I am the vine. And he says, ye are the branches. For without me you can do nothing. Christ becomes the tree of life. He says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And he says, and nobody cometh to the Father except by me. So the tree that was of a figure in the Old Testament dispensation in the garden, from which men are not allowed to have access to because they were corrupted in their own, and God says, no, before you access the life, I must give you the nature. To Solomon, it's not an experience, it's a vision. He says, when I look at this wisdom, it is a tree of life to him that finds her. And happy is everyone that retaineth her. And he says, one with greater wisdom is come. Now when Paul is walking in those sentences, when Paul is walking in this idea to have this full thing reconciling him, he says something so powerful in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6. Give me the amplified version. He says, When we are among the full grown, those who are spiritually mature, Christians, who are ripe in understanding, he says, when we get there, we do impart a certain wisdom. Now he's talking about the ministry. He says that our ministry to the mature is an impartation of the higher Wisdom, the knowledge of the divine plan, the Bible says, previously hidden. Why does Paul use the word previously hidden? He means that what the world did not know, there was a wisdom that was hidden, even from Solomon. The problem with many people is they're saying, oh, you know, when God made Solomon, he said, you know, I've given you wisdom that nobody has, nobody has ever had, nobody will ever have. No man. We're not talking about men. We're talking about spirits. Here we're not talking about men. We're not discussing men. If you're talking of men, go to Egypt, you'll see men. If you're talking about men, go to the world, you'll see men. Here we're talking about people which are more than men. When you become born again, you are a spirit with a soul in a body. Somebody shout amen. Now we say... Yet, when we are among the full grown, the spiritually mature Christians who are ripe in understanding, we do impart a higher wisdom, the knowledge of the divine plan previously hidden. He says, but it is indeed not a wisdom of this present age, or of this world, nor of the leaders or rulers of this age, who are being brought to nothing and are doomed to pass away. He says, but rather, we are setting forth a wisdom of God, once hidden from the human understanding, listen, and now revealed to us by God, he says, that wisdom which God devised and decreed before the ages for our glorification, listen to the word he uses, he says, to lift us up into the glory of his presence. In other words, 
to get to the fullest measure of the presence of God, the church must have a certain wisdom. Not a certain prayer. I'm not against prayer. Not a certain fasting. I'm not against fasting. Not a certain singing. I'm not against singing. Not a certain gifting. I'm not against gifts. But here he said that if we don't have that wisdom, if we do not walk in that wisdom, we cannot walk in the full glorification that was decreed and devised before ages to lift us up, the Bible says, into the glory of his presence. The only kind of presence that only the Godhead had, he said. Now, if that kind of wisdom in God is available, and he says it is by Christ, and it is greater than the wisdom of Solomon, do you know what that means? Can you even imagine what that means? I'll give you an example. Let me go deeper maybe to help some of you understand. In the book of Proverbs, the Bible says that when the lots are cast, okay, matters are resolved. That is the wisdom of Solomon. That's Solomonic wisdom. Are you hearing me? That when you cast lots, huh? when men are divided, reconciliations are done. That's Solomonic what? Wisdom. And indeed we see it even in the sign of the spoken prophet Jonah. That when was in a sheep, on his way to what? To Tashish. The Bible says Jonah fled from the presence of God. And when the sheep was in trouble and the waves were hitting, they said, who among us has anointed their God? And the Bible says, and they gathered all the people. And the Bible says, and they cut lots. And the Bible says, and the lot fell on Jonah. That's such a random thing as a lot. Eh? Just something you shake like this. Huh? In that randomness, thrown down, you can still point out to the man who God has an issue with. And that is all Solomonic wisdom. And it is great. And through that, matters were resolved. Matters were resolved. Solomon knew things. He knew he had the understanding of why lots are cast. Maybe even the people who used to cast these lots didn't have the full revelation. But Solomon, in his wisdom, explained why the lot is cast. You understand what I'm saying? Not all who cast lots cast in the name of God. Are you hearing me? And not all lots that fall, fall to the will of God. But there are lots that fall in will and purpose of God. Because they are ordained in the order of understanding the wisdom under which lots are what? A cast. Okay? Now, Paul comes to the New Testament and tells us, when I'm speaking about this wisdom, he says, this one is imparted to them that are fully mature. He's not saying it's not available. It is available. But it's another thing to be able to take it. You understand what I'm saying? He's not saying that God hasn't given. It's one thing for God to give. It's another for us to know how to take. To walk in. To walk in. Now, that is why later, when he says in the verses 8, he says, none of the rulers of this age would perceive and recognize and understood this. For if they had, they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. Now, that's why the next verse says, For eye has not seen, ear has not heard, has not entered the hearts of men. And then he says, The things God has prepared for them that love him, for he has revealed them unto us, to us, by his Spirit. So we carry the revelation of those things eye has not seen, ear has not heard, has not entered the hearts of men. Why does he call them eye not seen, ear not heard, not entered into the hearts? Because as from that time of Solomon to the day of the death and resurrection of the person of Christ, all the church knew was Solomonic wisdom. The church never understood messianic wisdom. And so, of course, I know people say, oh, I need Solomonic wisdom. Ask for it. Ask for it. It's good. It's not bad. You understand what I'm saying? It's not what? It's not bad. It's okay to ask for Solomonic wisdom. But now in the New Testament, with all due respect, we realize that even Solomonic wisdom was a shadow. 
I say Solomonic wisdom was a shadow. The substance was Christ. Do you understand what I'm saying? And now in the New Testament, when you receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, and you say, today I receive you as my Lord and Savior. For the Bible says, for it pleased the Father, that in him should dwell all the fullness of God bodily. Who? That is Jesus. Now, question. If you needed to know the wisdom of Solomon and you needed to count every sand on the seashore to know it, what do we need to know? How much wisdom is working in your spirit? Think about it. Breathe in and out and just think. If Solomon wrote 3,000 proverbs and if kings used to come to Solomon just to hear, and they carried everything just to get to Solomon. What will men do to get to you? When Jesus saw that, he said, uh -uh, nothing he shall not be brought to light. Some people use that to say, sins, what? Listen, God can't use that verse for sin. That verse can't be quoted for sin. Nothing hidden shall not be brought to light. Why? Because when we're talking about the Christ, we talk about the taking away of sins. We talk about the throwing of your sins to the ends of the earth that he shall remember them no more. So how can he open what he can't remember? Or how can he open what's not there? So when he says nothing that is hid shall not be brought to light, it means no man, no man, no man with this wisdom can be hidden. Whether you're in the deepest forest, in the poorest nation, in the dirtiest place, in the smelliest place, in the brokest place, in a ghetto, it doesn't matter where you are, when this thing sits upon your life, men will build roads to find you so they may. Now, if this wisdom is to the glory, our glory, it means this is the only thing that guarantees glory on your life. And this is the thing that guarantees the anointing on your life. This is the thing that guarantees the presence of God on your life. When tumors meet you, when cancer meets you, when HIV meets you, when it looks at you, it says, here comes the wisdom of God in human flesh. And it says, of the manifold wisdom of God to the intent of the church, that it may be known by the principalities and powers of this world. In other words, when the principalities, the powers, the demon spirits of this world meet us, in us they find the manifold wisdom of God. That's what he speaks about in Ephesians 3, verse 10. When you come in front of a sick person, Wisdom is come. The fact that you live in Uganda. When I read that thing, when I understood messianic wisdom, when I understood just how much, when I understood just what it means to carry a wisdom greater than Solomon, I realized that there is no problem that can stand before you and it doesn't see you that you're the answer. Somebody shout hallelujah. Wherever you go, you're the answer. In every nation you step, you're the answer. In every village you go, you're the answer. In every business you sit in, you're the answer. In every hospital you enter, you're the answer. In every school you go, you're the answer. In every circumstance, every situation. Messianic. Messianic. And how ironic that now this dispensation is trying to understand Solomon. Yet by order of things, Solomon is supposed to understand us. Did you understand what I just said? When the book of Proverbs is read, it is supposed to be explaining you. You're not the one supposed to be explaining it, no. When people read Proverbs, 
it should be seen as yes wisdom but of inferior quality to what you are able to release out of your spirit for any circumstance on the earth that means in the case when two women come and they are fighting for a baby I would not have judged it the way Solomon did I'm not saying he was wrong I'm only saying the one with greater wisdom is come <laughs> Who has understood what I just said? I would not judge it that way. Why? Because in the mystery of the Messianic, you have something called the unction. When two women come, you tell her you're lying. This is the mother. Take your child home. Hey, 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 hey. Did you understand what I just said? In the Messianic, we know who is the mother. Ah! How did you know? For the Spirit of God that rides in the inside of you, it touches the deep things of God. Yeah, the bottomless things of God. He says the Word of God is quick and active. It's sharper than a double-edged sword. It separates the bone and marrow. It exposes our hearts and thoughts to what they really are for nothing. is hid before Him for all things are naked before Him and defenseless. And I'm a child of the Word. I know who is the mother. I know who is the mother. What Solomon asked for, you got born into. I said what he asked for, you got born into. That means when I read these proverbs, it's good. But I have something deeper in my spirit. I have something deeper in my spirit. You see, Jesus, in Matthew eleven twenty five, he says, I thank you, Father, he says, because you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent. And he says, and you have revealed them unto beds. Now, this revelation was not to wise men. Somebody take it. This revelation was not to wise men. This one was not to men who are prudent. Say, no, this one, it's revealed to babes. He's not talking about the baby mature. He's talking about the heart. And we see this pattern of the heart in the mind he has. For let this mind be in you which was in Christ. For who found it no robbery? To be like one with God. The Bible says he took on upon himself the fashion of a man. And he humbled himself. The spirit of humility in the person of the Christ has accessed way more. Way more. And now he tells us that there's a wisdom for the wise and prudent, but there's also wisdom for them which have the heart of babes, which he calls childlike faith. He's not saying that they should be immature. He's talking about the attitude of the openness of men which are yielded. That is why I told people that the wisdom that is Solomonic is gifted. The wisdom that is Messianic is inherited. There's a difference. This one is a nature issue. The other one is a calling issue. When you became born again, you entered an inheritance. Paul calls it incorruptible. You know, people have been asking themselves, why does the church of Jesus Christ lack power? Let me explain. It is because it is moving in more Solomonic than Messianic. That's why when you go in the story of Solomon, the wisdom of Solomon is wonderful. But the demonstration of power is not much with the life of Solomon. Even though it's important. I'm not saying it's wrong to have Solomonic wisdom. But what happens when you get the Holy Spirit on you? When the anointing of God sits on you. And it says, and that unction knows all things. That means when you're born into this thing, you don't study Proverbs. You know Proverbs. I'll give an example. A man wakes up and says, I thought in my heart to give myself wine, acquainted my heart with wisdom, to lay hold on folly, until I might see what was good for the sons of men, that they should do under the heaven of all the days of the earth. The man with wisdom is still searching. 
You understand what I'm saying? He says, I made me great works, I builded me houses, I planted my vineyards, listen, designed gardens and parks and planted a variety of fruit and trees in them. And he says, I made pools of water to irrigate the gloves of trees. And he says, I bought slaves, male and female, who had children, giving even more slaves, and I acquired a large heart, flocks larger than any before me in Jerusalem. And he says, I piled up silver and gold, loot from the kings and kingdoms, I gathered a chorus of singers, so that they me with song, most secure of all pleasures, voluptuous mates for my bed. And he says, oh, how I prospered. And he says, I left all of my predecessors in Jerusalem, far behind. The KJV said, and in all of these things, he says, my wisdom remained with me. Right? And the next verse says, whatsoever my eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy of my heart, rejoicing in all my labor. This was my portion of all my labor. And the Bible says, and then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought, and on the labor that I had labored to do it with the wisdom. Behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. This was a man with such wisdom, but he was still searching. And then, even with all his wisdom, he learned another lesson. After doing all of this stuff, and today in the church we teach people that you don't need to do those things because Solomon tells us that they are vanity. Whoa, whoa, you lost the plot. The church is not even supposed to be in the space of being told not to do because it is learning from what Solomon did. Christ Jesus didn't do all that. He did none of that. He knew no sin. Do you understand what I'm saying? And in him you live, move, and have your own being. This is what we're supposed to tell the church. We're supposed to tell the church that what Solomon had was not enough for him. And now we have one who has more than enough because he is the fullness that filleth all things. And this is the thing I've realized about this thing. When this wisdom hits you to understand, because of the glory that settles on your life, it's amazing the anointing it releases on your life. It is not the anointing men get by gift. This is another kind of anointing. That is why Paul says, and my words were not with the convincing, plausible words of men, of the wisdoms of men. He says, but as it was in the demonstration of the power of God as a sign of the power of God operating on me and staring in my ear as the most holy emotions and thus persuading them. Why? Because... He realized that without this wisdom, there is no New Testament. So, if they are to count the wisdom on your life, we don't count sand. That's nothing. That is why I told people, what's inside there is infinite. It's endless. I will never wake up on a day and I don't have something to preach. It will never happen. It will never happen. It will never happen. I can never wake up one day and I don't have something stirring in my spirit. All I need is the inspiration of His presence. I just need to just ratalapa. And when the presence of God, the degree increases and I can feel it. The Word of God will constantly stay open to you. The Word is not close to a believer. Believers are closed to it, but the word is not closed to a believer. It is given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom. Let me tell you. If kings came for Solomon, stones will come for you also. Oceans will flip and pour water to the direction of your sail if they have to. Internet will break for you. YouTube will break for you. Facebook will break for you. Inventions and innovations of the world will break for you. Why? Because you carry messianic. That is why the day he was born. Men which did not know the God of Israel. The day he was born, they said, where is he? Which is born? The king of the Jews. In other words, when they saw that star, they knew this one is a different fellow and he says and this is love made perfect that you might have confidence on that day 
For as he is, so are we in this world. We cannot fail. This world is ours. I want to provoke you to dream. Dream things that even scare you out of your body. I want you to open your mouth and make a prayer so crazy. Come on, pray. 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 What a friend I found No closer ever I that the excellence of power might be of God. Rosaralalabayaralala <laughs> Rimando di delle bosse le bacosse le 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 It's in there. It's in there. It's in there. 
It's in them. Glory to God. It's in them. It's in them. It's in them. Call it out. Call it out. Call it out. Call it out. Masalaba. Rabba Yalaba. Sekereba. Brako Teleta. It's in them. It's in them. Call it out. Raise your hands in the air. I want to decree these words and speak upon you and decree and I declare in the name of Jesus Christ that Messianic wisdom is yours. And it's going to be manifesting in everything you do. Mysteries will flow out of you. The demystification of the mystery of Christ will be so heavy on you. Revelation will flow out of you. Faster than men can count. Bigger than men can articulate. And as you're speaking, power will move, the lame will walk, the blind will see, the foundations of the earth will get in their courses, the stars will align for you, the sun will stand still for you, nations will bow to you, to the glory of your name, kings shall come to your rising, gentiles shall come to your light, strangers shall serve you, favor will be your mantle, the glory of God will be evidence on your life. If you believe it, shout Amen! Shout Amen! Thank you, Lord. Clap your hands to Jesus. Come on, clap like you know what you have. Clap like you know what you have. The better one than Solomon is come. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And it's all inside there. I'm a solution. I'm an answer. I'm an answer. Even the hardest question. None is hid from my spirit. It's in there. To the glory of God. To the glory of God. That's who I am. That's who I believe. Hey, listen. Some of you are entering season not far from now where the biggest people are going to look for you the biggest people in the world are going to look for your number the richest in the world are going to look for your number the wisest in the world are going to look for your number the greatest in the world are going to look for your email they are going to scroll through your Facebook pages they are going to Google and YouTube your name give the Lord a mighty hand of a praise if you believe it this is our nation. This is our generation. This is our time. This is our season. Now. 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 Thank you, Lord. You're sick in your body. By this wisdom, receive your healing. Receive your healing. Receive your healing. I don't care what you're suffering from. Back issues are healing. Swelling are healing. Hearing is restored. The blind, heart disease, cancer of the throat. God is healing me. He's healing. Give the Lord a man of praise. If you're here and you've never given your life to Christ, I want to invite you to one with greater wisdom. I want to invite you to a God who gave his life for you and became all things for your sake that he might save you. Wherever you are, if you said today is the day, repeat these words after me. Say, Jesus, I thank you for your love for me. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for loving me. I believe that you are the Son of God who shed his blood 
for me. Tonight, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Amen. God bless you. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Sonero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at sonerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.sonero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at UMA Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Sonero. Finero, make manifest.